Now, over and beyond the fiscal cliff, the Obama administration has a number of items on its agenda for the next one or two years. The first is to implement the health care law that was enacted over 18 months ago. This is going to basically compel 30 million Americans who don't have health insurance to buy it. And what the government right now is trying to do is to create insurance exchanges in each state for people to buy the insurance policies through. But several states controlled by Republican governors are not crediting these exchanges, and it's not clear right now exactly what will be done to address this void, to address this vacuum. The federal government may itself have to intervene to create a framework for people to be able to buy health insurance policies. Second big issue is the implementation of the Dodd-Frank law. This was a major financial regulatory bill passed by the U.S. Congress two years ago. It's over 2,000 pages long, and it compels agencies of the government to draft hundreds of new rules to actually implement the law. At the current time, we've only drafted about one-third of these rules. The rest are still evolving at the SEC but other agencies. And all these new rules are going to have a profound effect on the U.S. banking system because they will significantly increase bank regulatory compliance costs. This will have an adverse effect on profits. And the American Banking Associ Association told me a few months ago they think these new laws will cut in half the number of U.S. banks. America's always been different from other industrial countries. If you go to Britain, Canada, Australia, France, Germany, the country's controlled by four or five major banks. The U.S., by contrast, has thousands of banks. 20 years ago, we had 15,000 banks. Now we're down to just under 8,000. And the ABA predicts, with all these new laws, we will, by 2020, have less than 4,000 banks. So this is a very major change in the character of the U.S. financial system. Dodd-Frank will also have international implications. Right now, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission is trying to change the regulation of the non-deliverable forward market. It wants to force all this activity onto formal futures exchanges, not to have it occur through bilateral agreements between various banks. And we've had in the last few months protests from most Asian countries that what the CFTC is doing could be adverse to the development of futures markets in this part of the world. Because they feel what the CFTC is trying to do is to effectively force all this trading activity onto U.S. futures exchanges at the expense of those elsewhere in the world. So we have an international and domestic dimension to this issue of financial regulation. Third important area is energy regulation. Right now, the Environmental Protection Agency is drafting lots of new rules on carbon emissions. And the basic goal of these new laws is to basically drive out of business America's coal-burning power stations. We've already had in the last two or three years a major move away from coal towards natural gas. And with all of these new rules still being promulgated, we will effectively, over the next 10 or 15 years, end the use of coal for producing power in the United States. A very, very far-reaching change. They're also talking about new ways to regulate the gas fracking technology that's responsible for the tremendous increase in U.S. oil and gas reserves over the, next two or over the last two or three years. They're not going to stop this activity, but they do want to regulate it more carefully because they're concerned about the impact it's having on water supplies and things like that. And this energy regulation issue is very, very important because America right now is in the midst of a great oil and gas boom. In the last three years, we've increased U.S. oil production by 1.4 million barrels. We could in 10 years be producing as much oil as Saudi Arabia and Russia, over 10 million barrels a day. We've also had huge natural gas discoveries. The price of natural gas in the United States has fallen to $3 per MCF. In this part of the world, if you buy it in LNG form from Australia and Qatar, it's $15 or $16 per MCF. So this is a very, very critical issue. Global warming is also an issue. 
We didn't talk about it much during the election campaign, but Obama did focus on the issue in his first administration. And the House passed a major cap and trade bill, imitating what Europe did five and six years ago to try and price carbon more aggressively, to discourage pollution, to discourage carbon emissions. The legislation passed the American House, but it couldn't pass the Senate. It was killed by the coal-burning states. It's not clear what Obama will do in his second term to revisit the issue. But there has been talk about possibly doing what Australia is doing right now, having a carbon tax. But the Republicans will basically oppose this in the House of Representatives. The Republicans actually don't think global warming is a real issue. They think the whole thing is a fraud. And therefore, there's no support in that party for any effective action to curtail global warming. But if Obama had some room for maneuver on this, there's no doubt he would favor more effective action because he personally thinks that global warming is a danger. And the recent storms we had in New York a few weeks ago were viewed by many people as a sign that global warming is having all kinds of adverse effects on the weather, droughts in Australia, new storms in the North Atlantic, and this will, over time, take a very heavy toll producing tremendous economic costs, property damages, and therefore does warrant that we take seriously this danger of global warming and other cumulative effects on the global climate. Trade policy is also very important. The Obama administration finally completed over a year ago three free trade agreements negotiated by the Bush administration four and five years ago. FTAs with Colombia, with Panama, and Korea. The administration's major focus now is on something called TPP, a Trans-Pacific Partnership, which involves trade relations with several Asian countries, and now also recently Canada and Mexico. The unclear player in the TPP talks is Japan. Prime Minister Noda has flirted over the last six months with having Japan join these talks, but there's no consensus on this issue in his party or in Japan itself. There's great opposition from the farmers, as well as from Japan's medical industry, as they're very much concerned about American competition in the area of healthcare care services. But in any case, the administration hopes to complete in the year ahead a major new Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement. This is also part of a so-called new pivot towards Asia. It's a new attempt by the Obama administration to reemphasize the importance of Asia in America's foreign policy and security policy. And the fact that Obama came to this part of the world four weeks ago or three weeks ago to visit Myanmar, Thailand, and Cambodia, to attend the East Asian Summit in Cambodia, is a sign that the administration very much is promoting this idea quite aggressively and quite actively. And the goals are multiple. We recognize this part of the world is very important to the global economy Therefore, we want to be a player here, an investor and a trader. It's also part of an attempt to contain the rise of China as a major new power. There is a fear that in Washington that China could become, over, 20, 20, over 10 or 20 years, a hegemonic power in this world again, as it was hundreds of years ago. And there's great concern as well about China's claims over various territory in the South China Sea. The U.S. has spoken out in various forums that this must be treated as a multilateral issue, not just a bilateral issue between China and various Asian nations.